Good afternoon, and welcome to another presentation of the Associated Student Speakers Program. Our guest today is the chairman of the board of Unison Corporation. He is um, one of the founders of Apple Computers. He served as director, secretary, and vice president of research and development for that company, and he holds the patents for his creation of the Apple One computer. Other than those outstanding accomplishments, our guest today also threw a great party last Labor Day, and he called it the Us Festival. And he said that he simply wanted to throw a party that included his contemporaries, music lovers, and computer hobbyists and clubs. It was, it was a rock festival and a technology fair, and it drew over half a million people last year. And there was also a live interactive satellite transmission between the US Festival and a cable hookup in Moscow. And I'm not sure if that's being repeated. Maybe he'll tell you about that a little later. He's here today to talk about this year's festival, US 83, which is taking place May 28, 29, and 30 at the Glen Helen Regional Park in San Bernardino. And uh, our guest has said he thinks it will be the international entertainment event of the year. First, we're going to show you some video highlights of last year's festival. And then our guest will come out here and say a few words. And then he'll bring, he also brought a couple of friends along today, which I think you'll like. And as you look at the video clips before Mr. Wozniak comes out to speak, you might look for somebody you've seen in this very ballroom before. Hope you enjoy him. Just look at the monitors. Also, if you'd like to ask questions, microphones are, of course, at the side. Thanks. Fleetwood Mac was there. Headline the second day. Internationally famous police headline the first day. Formed brilliantly. A versatile band, Santana. Ladies and gentlemen, 
Give a warm UCLA welcome to Steve Wozniak. Oh, I, I look at it. I, hello, thank you. Um, I just hope we get this many people at the US Festival this year. Um, before, before beginning, I'm not going to talk too much. We're going to leave a lot, of, lot open for answers and questions as to what's going to be at the show and what do we expect in the way of the tech fair and the Moscow connection and I can actually some, maybe talk over the hiss. Um, before that, I'm going to give a little bit of introduction into some of the things that don't get presented. We aren't obviously those of you who were at last year's US Festival know that it's a lot more than uh, uh, just the music that was presented there. I'm going to go in right now, very shallowly, into the whys and how it came about of the US Festival. Um, last year, you know, the idea of an intriguing, large music event with a lot of headliners in one place as a starting point comes into a lot of people's heads, especially a lot of 18, 20-year-olds every year. It's an easy idea. And, of course, you know, the, the thought goes away two minutes later just due to the fact that there's no way it could ever happen. Oddly enough, some, somehow the right events were in place when the thought came into my head in the year 1981 to allow it to happen. First of all, Due to an unexpected, unplanned plane crash, I wasn't employed as a full-time engineer. I had a lot of freedom in my time and in my head to let the thought come back a few times. Sec thirdly, I obviously had the money. And fourthly, I was not unwilling to take the risk with the money to do what I th really believed in. Um, our first show, first measure of success was we started thinking about a lot of plans. We decided to call ourselves the US Festival. Us is sort of a way of thinking of the 80s, you know. In the 60s, it was blame the other guy, we against they. In the 70s, blame yourself, I'm responsible. That was, you know, est in Scientology, make life work for yourself, the me decade. The 80s, or a lot of people are talking about more of an unselfish thinking, us decade. Sometimes don't blame anyone. We all get along globally. Um, we started thinking about where to get a site. We started to search all throughout California and considered several, lost some. We had just enough respectability with the Apple computer connection, some educational connection, a lot of PhDs on our staff to uh, finally get approvals to hold it in California. Bill Graham's been looking for a site to do it for about 10 years. Uh, as far as booking together a music event, we got Bill Graham. We considered, we thought of doing a technology fair, an exhibit of modern day, you know, not super state of the art stuff, but just normal computer uses and uh, video graphics, demonstrations, computers with synthesizers. Uh, fortunately, we made the decision to put them in air-conditioned tents last year's show. Um, so the ideas came about, and we didn't, you never know, as you start to have all these dreams, it's really intriguing. What if we're able to pull this show off and do all these things? It's going to be incredible. Fortunately, we were well enough financed that we didn't hold back and only get 40 porta-potties like a lot of promoters have been known to do. And about two weeks before the show, the tents were going up, all the, the stage was constructed, the delayed sound towers, the FAA's control tower, a microwave tower for pay phones, everything was in place and we realized that we'd created the city of our dreams for three days. Um, the more important measure of success came a few days later, a few weeks later when uh, the people who attended walked away happy, feeling that there was a lot of planning, organization, the, the traffic flow, from the traffic flow to uh, the music event itself to what do you do during the day to keep yourself occupied, looking at the arts and crafts fair of the 80s, which we called a tech fair. Um, they judged it a success. We also got incredible, all the, all the reporters before last year's show were saying, you're going to expect all these disasters. How are you going to stop them from breaking down the fences and rioting and violence and deaths and all this? And we were lucky enough not to even have a, you know, any major disruptive events like that. We came away from a show taking care of a couple hundred thousand people a day with not a single lawsuit, only 36 arrests, which is less than you get at a football game, uh, and uh, basically only two reported thefts. I'm sure there were quite a many unreported. So it was very much a success in the headlines, 
and the only place we lost was financially. And great, we felt great. This was the only one we were ever going to do in our lives. The mail started coming in, and I read about a thousand letters that came to me personally. Pretty much, I couldn't believe that 100% of them said, didn't expect it to be so well organized. Everything was there. I, every, you know, we were t well taken care of. It was a spiritual event in my life. Even a lot of people started thinking about what this us philosophy was. Um, I decided that if we could pos not, if not lose millions of dollars again, and it looked very reasonable, we would go ahead and people deserve to have another event like this in their lives uh, from a consumer point of view. And we decided finally that, yeah, we could do one and make a profit this year. And uh, the day of the show, we'll actually know because ticket sales are still a little low this year, but they were low last year. The talk is all over the nation. We've sold thousands of tickets in many states, even on the East Coast, over a 1,000 tickets already in Canada. Last year, we sold a third of our tickets in Northern California, far more than places like San Diego. We've already sold many more tickets in Phoenix than we've sold in San Diego. I think a lot of people locally are expecting, oh, I'll just catch these groups this summer when they're in my area. I'll go to a couple small light shows. Unfortunately, that's the one problem is that a lot of these big headline groups at the US Festival won't be playing many five shows throughout California. They decided, oh, instead of playing five shows, we'll just charge the US Festival people five times normal. Um, this year, that's not going to be true next year. We finally have crossed a threshold to where the groups are finally calling us want to know if we have any more festivals coming up in the future. And we had to pursue them very heavily this year, in spite of last year's uh, excellent publicity. Um, so anyway, we decided to go on with the show. Everything is in place this year, we, except we've scaled up somewhat. We have a larger stage, the largest ever in the world, the most incredible lighting system ever in the world. A lot of heavy metal bands, the finest heavy metal concert probably almost ever, the finest country western concert ever, the finest collection of new wave music in, new wave, in 1983 anywhere in the world. And a lot of that came about due to losing confidence with all the experts who told us they were doing the fine job they were being paid to do in selecting the finest music event of 1983 and just went to a few high schools and started listening to the kids. And you know when you're in high school, you know which are the right groups. And except for a few, they're always unobtainable you know, and problems that we had booking groups like Duran Duran and Adam Ant. We put together the finest newer music, younger music uh, event of the year. Uh, David Bowie was an incredible coup because we were told about 20 times, you know, we, we were pursuing every major group in the world for our headliners. All the Springsteens, McCartneys, Rolling Stones, everyone possible. They're just not purchasable at the store. You know, go down and a loaf of bread is two dollars or two million dollars. Um, David Bowie, we'd been turned down about 20 times. They're going to have a European tour that time. You know, not available. Uh, had a lunch with one of our speakers. We've got an incredible speakers program this year with speakers such as myself, Stuart Brand, uh, let me think, Bob Moog of Moog Synthesizers, Bianca Jagger, Dick Gregory. Ray Bradbury's one of the speakers. Had a lunch with Ray Bradbury, you know, and science fiction writer of old. And to those of us in the computer world, science fiction writers are some of our idols. So uh, Ray Bradbury said he had one request for the US Festival, David Bowie. Okay, and I was a little astounded. And I, he said David Bowie was a fan of his and had spent a couple days with him once and he wanted to co-author a telex to Bowie. That night I went home to Cal Northern California, the Bay Area Music Awards. I happened to accidentally be seated with Bowie's lawyer. And I didn't, didn't say what was on my mind, but I knew we'd been turned down. I, you know, and I asked if they'd announced their European tour yet and they hadn't and that was all I needed to know. So we set out the next day, got our promoter. By then it was Barry Fay, who was the Bill Graham of the Denver area, uh, on the phone to what would it take to get Bowie. And we discovered that to get them to cancel a couple European dates, fly their entire crew over, build a matching set in the Los Angeles area and everything, it was going to be quite expensive. Uh, probably the most ever paid to any rock performer anywhere, anytime. And they were not considering a state's tour before that. We basically talked them into it. And now they're going to play some other dates out out east, they decided later. Um, so in addition to paying them a fortune for being able to pull off the impossible of getting them here and all of their equipment, we had to get them interested in what we were doing, how incredible the sound system was at this event, and it was the finest in the world. Uh, we also had to, some other groups had clauses in their contracts saying we get paid as much as anyone else. So they got an unexpected, some groups got as much as an unexpected half million dollars that they uh, had already agreed to play anyway. So uh, it was an atrocious financial decision, but uh, uh, we decided even if we're going to lose money this year again, it's going to be the finest in the world that no one will forget. The big thing that's going to be remembered this year 
is the entertainment technology, everyone's going to see it and going to realize while they're there, part of what's going to go through their head is an almost spiritual, emotional connection because they're going to know as they're seeing it and hearing it that they're never going to see anything like this collection of technology anywhere in the world in their lives probably because, for example, we had a large daytime video screen at our concert last year. First time ever at a rock concert in the United States, one of these daytime screens had been used, and that's the star of the show, called Diamond Vision. This year, uh, of course, you're familiar with it from Dodger Stadium, but rock concerts is pretty unusual. Uh, this year, we've got three of them in one place. That'll probably never happen again. So we could put them a little bit further back into the crowd uh, for better viewing and a little off to the side towards one of the beer gardens so a lot of the people like to spend time casually during the day. You know, I watched last year and people sat down on their blankets, had a good picnic day, didn't really uh, watch the, uh, the stage until the headliners at night. You know, it's not a, you can't watch a stage for 12 hours. Uh, so at least they'll be able to watch it on sort of a TV and the music is excellent quality playing in the background. Um, I'm the sort of person who's walked out of every outdoor concert I've ever gone to and because I can't stand lousy, loud, distorted sound. I hate it. And, you know, I like fine speakers in my home. I've, I, have, I have, honest to God, walked out of every one, even when it's special invitations, because I can't stand it. The US Festival truly surprised me. We said, we're going to make no sacrifice, period. The finest sound system that's possible to construct in 1982, that was last year, um, is going to be there, and we got we had to get some of the largest sound companies in the world to join their equipment and join forces and do different parts of it. We put four huge sound towers out with the proper computerized delays in the sound so it would sound perfect. Everywhere you walked, for some reason, the sound was totally without, it was like without echo, it was the purest, cleanest sound ever, and it was not loud and distorted, and everyone who was there uh, knows it, and the words around uh, to the extent we almost got somebody like Springsteen this year. And they're going to be watching us very closely this year. The spec this year, don't change the sound system at all. You know, we scale, of course, we didn't scale it down. Uh, other parts we scaled up, like parking and uh, whatever. The, uh, we also have a couple of 100-foot video screens for nighttime use this year. Last year, we had a couple of 40-foot Ida 4 screens. And they didn't work out too well because it was so hot, it melted the screens. And we didn't have the proper screens. This year, uh, the 100-foot screens are going to be incredible on either side of the stage. The, uh, the lighting, the, the, comp the collection of lighting we've got has never been done to this magnitude before. All the, uh, the skylights and special effects. Of course, we've got a lot of heavy metal groups. We're going to have the most incredible special effects show, and I'm not going to describe it further than it go some of it comes from the earth and some from the sky, and it's going to be long remembered by everyone that's there. We have our technology fair again. We included a career fair for a lot of 20 to 24-year-olds, which is the bulk of our audience. They're interested in... Um, in what sort of jobs are available in high-tech companies. So we're going to have some people there, you know, at least to inform them if they're interested. You don't have to take anything seriously for the three days, though. You can get away from the serious world if you want. A um, lot of computer exhibits again. We've got the speaker's tent, which I described. We expanded an uh, unusual thing we did last year. It's the first time in the history of the world it ever got accomplished, which was we had a simulcast over to Moscow. Basically, we decided we wanted to, you know, approach the, the whole situation. A lot of this us philosophy of thinking of others, the whole world is, you know, can, also can be dealt with person to person, friend to friend, uh, works out pretty good. And we did a simulcast. Uh, we got permission about three days before our show. We'd been working on it for six months. Uh, they had to use some equipment. NBC had taken over to Russia for the 1980 Olympics, which were basically canceled by our government. Um, and we, we sent rock and roll from our show live over to a group in Russia, a group of music enthusiasts watching it on a big projection screen over in a studio, and they sent some of their bit finest rock and roll music back live to our screen. But because it came about so hastily, it was not publicized, there was a lot of tension between Bill Graham and our people that caused Bill Graham not to believe it was real and it was coming from a studio in Southern California, and it was not, so he did not really announce it properly to the crowd, and it was difficult to really know what happened. This year, the first day of our show, which is sort of our new wave day, uh, at 9.30 a.m. in the morning, we've got a tent where we're going to send an education panel over to Russia via satellite. They're going to send an educational panel, even with their education minister, back to, back to us, and the audiences in the tent will be able to ask questions from both sides to both sides. Then that evening, we're going to broadcast uh, Men at Work live over to Russia, despite the fact the Kremlin's against Western cultural influences, like rock and roll, and they're going to uh, send some of their top bands back to us and they claim that this year it'll even be from an outdoor concert. Um, 
but a lot of the spectacle of the entire Us Festival and the site and everything that was created and, and how it, basically there were no lines, how comfortable it is, uh, is going to be well, that's what's going to be remembered this year. That's all I'm going to do right now because I'm sure the questions will answer a lot of other more specific questions. I'd like to introduce right now Richard Blade from K-Rock and Danny Elfman of Oingo Boingo. Should we go over here? And we're open for questions. Uh, Steve, Hello. I'm wondering um, what in brief is the problem with Bill Graham in dealing at this level and also the, uh, given the economics that you outlined, do you feel that you're going to extinct yourself? And, oh, okay, two questions. And also, one other, just one other thing, and that is, what about new groups? Does that exclude new groups because of the pricing and all? Okay, three questions, and I may forget them. First of all, Bill Graham issue was in the press a lot. Um, of, Bill Graham had a lot of, uh, he puts on a good show for the consumer. The person who buys a ticket gets what they want from Bill Graham. He does an excellent job of, of his area's uh, of presenting the show to them. However, he has a lot of run-ins with everyone in the music business, with groups, managers, agents, a lot of yelling and fighting. He's like the toughest person in the country, and there are other promoters not like him. He had a huge run-ins with the Unison staff because we are not from the music business. If we, if we, if we were, we couldn't have possibly done such an incredible show. Um, we, uh, basically, he saw a lot of things we were doing that were so different, and he didn't know how to account for them. And uh, he, he is the expert on crowd control, and we are not. And uh, had a lot of run-ins with the Unison staff. I was the only one excluded. I didn't even know there were fights going on. I always, you know, backed Bill Graham's expertise. He and I have gotten along tremendously forever. Our families are good friends. He wanted to do this year's show again. It came very close, but I, I wanted him to. But I would not step on the Unison staff. They had to be happy with being in control, uh, you know, from the president on down of what was going on, or they wouldn't be happy and motivated. Uh, I worked very subtly, and occasionally I would get an, an executive from Unison to listen to Graham's predictions as to where we were going, what we would get in video rights, this and that, and just at least see him as an honest person. And it came very close to getting Bill Graham, but Barry Fay is the Graham of Denver, and uh, he was in the right place at the right time. Second, economics. This year, we're more or less looking at it like um, we, we did run very, uh, everything ran a lot more than we were originally projecting, a lot of revenue sources prepaid video sales and uh, commercial co-op sponsors didn't come through as well as we'd like and we have to sell a lot of tickets to uh, break even, possibly 800,000 total tickets for four days and they're selling pretty slow right now, under 200,000 tickets so far so uh, it may be a, there may be a chance that we're not around although we may have enough credibility after this year works because we know now that it's going to work much better, much finer even than last year. If it works well we can possibly get other sources of revenue more easily for a show in 84 and we're planning if we're successful this year to go on and have more shows around the country in 84 prime candidate right now is tending to become the east coast because everywhere I go that's all I hear requests from the east coast even when I speak to computer shows out east a question comes up from the audience saying are you going to have an US festival out here so uh, third question was uh, in terms of oh economics I want to make one comment on the economics Last year, we put it together, and we more or less, it was a lot of coming from a dream, but a strong feeling that um, there, the timing was right for this kind of event. If we put together the largest music event in the world, the one and only in the world, that it, if we did a good job and the people who came liked it, we would also be successful financially. We were very, very wrong. We lost you know, so much. We don't like to talk about it because it's partly embarrassing by the size of the number, but it's also embarrassing to even talk about the, the percentage of counterfeit tickets, and I won't say that. Um, this year, this year, we're pretty much, would not have repeated it. There was no intent to repeat it. I got incredible mail. It looked like we could make a profit, and uh, I'm going to be a little bit flexible in thinking about a few things that could be overcome next year, such as paying outer space numbers for a lot of the groups, and uh, uh, also weird personal last minute decisions like Bowie although we uh, had a problem putting Henny headliners together. Uh, next question. Oh, no, he, he had a third one. He had a third one I wanted to answer. Well, just the exposure of new talent, you know, given oh, the... right. Uh, first of all, I'll, I'll, the most important thing, even at a mu music event in our lives, is what is the impression in your head, even in computers. If you get a bad first impression, look at our Apple III computer. It can be the finest product in the world by a functional calculated definition but it can still never overcome a bad first impression. 
the impression of what music groups are, it's pretty much limited to a lot of the high-end groups in the country that have a lot of exposure on radio and TV. This, up to this year, uh, we had to go out and heavily pursue you know, paying fortunes to talk them into the fact that we were serious, we were real, this was really going to come off again. They didn't believe it. The entire music industry and the agents ganged up on us, and they, they did something they occasionally do in some areas. They, they, they escalate these prices. A lot of promoters have called me, and, and they are so pissed. They can't believe some of these groups asked for this much, and they're upset, but they cannot go public, and they'll deny it if I say, say them by name because um, they're in the business, and I, am not, I do not have to do this for, for my life. I'm not a mutant, so you know, eventually I can talk about it as much as I want. Um, this year, that's true. All of a sudden, we've crossed over a threshold. As soon as we announce this year's show, instead of us calling them, and tr can we persuade you to play a certain date, a certain place, all of a sudden they started calling us saying, have you got something coming up at the end of the summer? Are you going to have a festival next year? So all of a sudden, we're sort of a Super Bowlish event of rock and roll music that everyone's going to be looking at and focusing on, especially if we're successful this year. Um, not, it doesn't even matter profitably, but if we look, we're looked at as going well. So we've crossed that threshold, and uh, next year there'll be a lot of room for new groups. We could even think of adding a few at the last minute now, but when you have nine groups already booked to a day, it's way over what, you know, what makes any sort of sense. There's no place to add anything, you know, maybe uh, 7 a.m. Next. W were you thinking of new unsigned bands? Yes, um, Because that's always kind of tough because uh, they're not a draw. And when you're investing this much money, I think you need to have a draw. But if I can jump in, I think uh, Steve's taking a chance booking bands like The Divinals, Berlin, In Excess, and Wall of Voodoo. None of those bands are nationally known, and this is their big chance to get national exposure. All of them, I think, uh, are very good, particularly the Divinals, I think, are going to be a band to watch. The album is very powerful, and uh, from what I've heard from talking to their manager, the band are brilliant. And um, I think if, if people want to see new talent, then they should get, and see, uh, get in early and see those four bands. But if you're going to sign a band to appear at the US Festival or something of that size, which doesn't even have a record out, it's really, really tough because... Um, People just don't turn up. How many times have you been to see a concert, whether it's uh, Journey or Oingo Boingo, and you don't turn up for the opening band because you don't know who the hell they are, and you, turn, you, know, you find out that they're brilliant? So um, it's kind of tough to, I would think, put on uh, an unsigned band. So I, th I, th I think 1984 is the year we'll be able to do a lot more of that, and there are already plans in the works, and there are a lot of big groups in the country you'll hear about talking about doing maybe benefit for Olympic athletes. But if they ever decide to do a huge outdoor, uh, a huge concert for the public, there's obviously one site in the whole area that's right. Danny. Uh, I think the questions are at the mic. Hello. Mics. Danny, how do you think you'll like performing for such a huge group of people as compared to like the country club or something? <laughs> well, it's a lot different. Um, obviously, we did it last year, so we know what it's like. I guess that's probably why I'm here now, because I guess we're only two bands um, actually are appearing again this year, which we're really honored to be one of them. And uh, it's actually, we had toured with the police, so we'd done some very large concerts, nothing as big as the US Festival. It was a whole different ball game, and I'm sure it will be again, um, this one coming up. It's, it's hard to describe what it's like, because it's actually more frightening sometimes walking into a small club than out on stage in front of 100,000 people, and the hardest thing about having a real big audience is just remembering that they're all there even if you can't see them because if there's a video screen um, maybe and they can see you in the back of the crowd you can't see them <laughs> so it's it takes a little getting used to it's not something that uh, we're gonna master overnight I'm sure it's gonna take us a few more concerts like that before we really uh, learn how to cope with that kind of situation, but it's getting easier for us. We're really looking forward to it. Steve, first of all, I'd like to thank you and your staff, because I was there last year and I thought it was fantastic. <laughs> and uh, second of all, I'd like to ask you if um, you're going to have more computer graphics like your new Lisa computer up on the Diamond Vision? Uh, last year, a lot of our computer graphics was coming off an Apple II, and we have a lot of plans that are being worked on right now for that graphics presentation. Uh, I don't know, if I, no plans I know of yet for a Lisa with graphics. It's really not available for public ownership, and this is not being done by Apple. So, mm -hmm. no, uh, just a more, little more, you know, computer color animated graphics, mostly off Apple II. Uh, 
I'd also like to ask, um, did you ask Pink Floyd again this year? I know you asked we, them last year. We pursued Pink Floyd, and they were, boy, they weren't going to come out. And then all of a sudden, we heard maybe there is a slight chance if it's pursued heavily. And we got on that, but it didn't work, no. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I have a question for Danny Elfman. I was wondering, uh, is Oingo Boingo going to be producing another album shortly? And also, where do you get the ideas for your album covers? <laughs> well, I'm actually not supposed to talk about Oingo Boingo stuff. Um, I'm supposed to be speaking in regards to the festival coming up. Um, but just yeah, so I won't take it. up any time with it. We're right in the middle of one right now. It'll be finished in a couple of weeks, and God knows where the concepts come from. They just happen out of the blue. Thank you. <laughs> Richard, what exactly are you going to be doing at the S Festival? Are you going to um, be emceeing or anything? Or? That's what I was asking Steve backstage. We've been uh, talking about that. <laughs> I, I'm working very hard to get Richard into an MC status, and the Unison group keeps thinking we need a different MC personality in addition, so he'll at least be part of it. He'll probably be introducing Oingo Boingo. Yeah, poor man, right. I, I, I feel that the MCs for each day should be those who are close to the format of music for that day and can say the right things in the right vernacular of that audience that have more meaning. Yeah, and so I'm afraid, you know, we could put a, you know, a Wolfman Jack out there and, and that, I mean, you know, that's just not right. Yeah, not to mention, words, they have to remember the names of the bands as they come up, and that's really hard. That's right. Steve didn't want someone that would get out there and say, and now we have one of my favorite bands. They are the English in small letters Beat. Um, I'm not sure much about them. He didn't want someone. He wanted someone that uh, at least believes in the music, and I believe in the music. I know there's some criticisms on K-Rock's rotation, etc., but I honestly... Uh, love this stuff, and also uh, I was just saying to Steve that MV3 would like to offer its services free of charge to the US Festival because I think it's about time broadcast television in America got hip to some new music. I think MTV does a very good job within its confines, which is cable, and uh, this criticism of MTV, of course, because it plays heavy metal, it plays new wave, but um, it's good, it's a broad based thing. But MV3, particularly for day one and day three, would like to go backstage, it would like to talk to the artists, and we'd like to go to the markets that we're in. We'd like to say to Orlando and to Dallas and to Cincinnati and to Chicago and to Detroit, look at the music that's out there. There's all this new music. There's all this energy that's happening in America. There is Oingo Boingo. There is the English beat. There's In Excess coming out. For once, you know, let's listen to this music and give it a chance. And then maybe people will realize that the US Festival and, and events like this can really uh, be viable in enhancing the music situation, which, as we know, in the late 70s got real stale. And I think um, a combination of, of broadcast television, of honesty on stage, and some great bands like Oingo Boingo, I think is going to make the US Festival <laughs> dynamite far, this year. I'll give you the $10 far, later, Richard. <laughs> as far as MCs go at the US Festival, an interesting story. I mean, last year, I was very shy, and I didn't know you could ever meet a performer, and boy, I was all isolated and afraid. To, they must be... Everyone's mobbing them like groupies, and I felt very afraid to ever meet a single performer. I didn't until the third day. And it was kind of funny because Bill Graham was sort of the, the MC position. He sort of took that role, although you, um, as far as production of the event, the stage, the lights, the sounds, he just hires the same companies we're hiring this year. Um, it's like his group doesn't do that, but he's the MC. And uh, he told me, oh, these groups, you can't introduce them, Steve. Your friends can't introduce them because they all have to be introduced by the right words, by the right MC, the right personality. My feeling was that they ought to be introduced by someone who it's their favorite group in the whole world. I was even trying to get uh, Oingo Boingo introduced that way last time, and Graham kept telling me, no, 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 they have to, the right words have to be said. I wanted to introduce Pat Benatar, and he said, he finally uh, would, he said he'll do the introduction himself, and I can say the last two words, Pat Benatar. I had, you know, I had no idea that uh, it's, it's not really that tight. So um, uh, hope it may change this year. Yeah, a lot of bands are blown away by the fact that you want to introduce them. We introduced the B-52s last year, Ramondo and myself, and they were thrilled that we wanted to go out there. They thought that, you know, the DJs are going to be stuck up, that they really drive Corvettes and live in Hollywood Hills. And uh, if you ever see the K-Rock Paychecks, you'll know it's, it's Joke of the Month Club every time that comes. But... Uh, last year, all the, a lot of the K-Rock DJs, myself, Swedish Eagle, uh, Romando, etc., we went there, and after we introduced the bands, we took off our backstage passes because we didn't want to get rolled or anything for them because, obviously, there's a, a quite a good item to have. And we went out and we slept in the dirt for two days, and I had the greatest time of my life, and I said to Steve, I don't want any money, I don't want anything. I just want to be there this year because, damn it, the music is so good. Steve? St Steve? 
Aside from your visual computer graphics, what are you going to be showing in the, what I would call the science and arts of computers? <coughs> okay, well, graphics is obviously one of the arts. I mean, it's been used to, to eventually get to the stage, starting with small computers with not enough resolution to get to what's making up some of the modern movies and movie effects. Now, as far as music, we're going to have a lot of synthesizer effects at a very, for a low level, low cost, you can all of a sudden do a task today for $5,000 that two years ago cost 50000 and you couldn't even do as much. You buy a computer, a little keyboard that plugs into it, and the right software. You can lay down, you know, define your different instruments, play them each. You can have a complete digital recorder inside your computer with no tape recorder that will record 16 tracks. You can put it all together, change some of the instruments on some of the tracks, you know, in synthesizer style. Press a button and it prints out the sheet music. That will be demonstrated. We may even have a video presented to the entire audience very brief on some of these sort of concepts. We're going to have an art show this year that will include a lot of sculptures of everything from marble to, to metals and a lot of paint, rock-oriented, uh, by the guy who did the John Lennon statue, which will be included. And many of these sculptures are, are tons, and they'll have a ten of their own. Uh, uh, the artist even drew up a poster for the event that I think is going to be the poster of the year. That's all that I'm aware of. And there, oh, we're going to have some art on the stage. We're going to have a bunch of music groups. I did not mean uh, the visual uh, and auditory uh, satisfaction of our senses with computers. I meant that you're going to have any explanations of the principles, the scientific principles of computerization. Oh, um, in the technology fair, we're going to have some speakers, including myself, that come from that branch of, of things, and uh, I hope what you're interested in comes out. We also have a lot of futurists speaking. Uh, the speaking schedule, though, basically, you know, you'll, you'll, most people will go to the speaker's tent. It only holds, I don't know, a couple thousand at the most, but uh, that will not be, those speeches will not be given to the entire audience, because that's not what they're there for. Uh, it'll just be, it'll, it'll be covered, hopefully, on by the news. The news are the people, or the people who are going to get the word out to others uh, may cover it a little better or worse. Steve, I'm wondering, um, do, do you think that Unison has a social consciousness for the 80s, something beyond just transmitting uh, rock and roll to the Kremlin? Not well, necessarily new. Unison does not have a strong political <laughs> backing. Basically, uh, what we're saying is you can have uh, a few days in your life and get away from the serious world. You don't have to take up a certain banner to be there. Um, you know, we, we believe in, we, we thought about what, what's going on in the 80s. The Arts and Crafts Festival of the 80s is the technology fair. So we put in a tech fair. Uh, we thought about what's going on, the, uh, the, mu the entertainment technology of the 80s is the large daytime video screens and whatnot and powerful sound systems, and we went with the, the 80s movement there. Um, the 80s movement philosophically is moving in what's sort of called an us direction, and we didn't make this up. We didn't try to look around and what can we do and be religious leaders and dream up something interesting. We read Psychology Today magazine, you know, we read the morning paper, and everyone's saying that sort of thing. Uh, your education throughout your life, you'll find that in early stages, you'll be like we, we all were in the 60s. Early stage of education, I heard this on the radio the other night, is blame someone else. Okay, and that's sort of the we against they mode that we were in in the 60s. Then later on in your education, it's blame yourself. You're responsible. Make it work for you. That's the me thinking of the eight, the 70s with a lot of you know movements like Est and Scientology. How do I make life work for myself? A lot of people are moving in a direction in the 80s towards thinking a little more on a global basis. A lot of our decisions being unselfish and thinking about others, blame no one. Uh, anyway, I think that we decided we'll just be uh, up with the 80s and in tune with the times. So we're the US Festival. Steve, I'm Katie Manor from K-Rock. Hi, Richard. Hi, Danny. Hi. I didn't get to go last year because I filled in for Dusty, but I am going to go Monday to see Bowie. And I was wondering, you taped it last year, but you didn't obtain the rights. Are you going to do something about this year if we can look forward to it? Last, last year we did not obtain the rights in advance from the groups. We figured we could put together. A, we, we had to turn all the cameras on anyway to keep our video screens going all day. Mm -hmm. So we had everything taped from last year, but there's not much of a market to sell rock and roll product. Mm -hmm. And we could not put together and sell a product. I mean, basically what MTV did uh, this last weekend was just for free. 
Uh, it didn't work out financially. This year, we bought in advance the rights from all the group to a certain number of songs, certain minutes worth of songs as part of their appearance, except Bowie. Sorry, they wouldn't do it. It was their decision, not ours. I'll get them ours. for you, okay? <laughs> um, I, I hope so, because I, I, keep, I talk to their manager, and I say, at least you sh we got every, all the equipment there. You can record it, take the, take the tapes with you, and just in case it turns out exceptional. Um, but I doubt they will. As a matter of fact, they're the ones who are bringing in six people to walk all the video lines and make sure there are no tape recorders anywhere on anything. Um, so we're going to record everything. We, we bought the rights in advance. We were hoping to cut our financial risk this year and have to put up less of the money ourselves by pre-selling a video product. You'd never go ahead and record it unless it's pre-sold. We're doing a very unusual thing in this business. Uh, all of our deals with people like Paramount and Universal and, and 20th Century basically fell through to where we've got the product ourselves and after the fact we've got to go out and try to sell it either through third parties or directly to uh, everything from, from pay TV to HBO specials to uh, worldwide rights and it will bring in some revenues but there's no way we're taking the total risk ourselves that we can sell it this year. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Steve, may I ask you a question not related to us festival? Sure. Um, it said in California Magazine that you go to UC Berkeley to take computer science classes, and I was wondering what you think of the quality of university instruction of computer science classes and how relevant it is to uh, people who want to work in the computer field. Okay, yeah, I went to Berkeley for my final year last year. I had a plane crash, which basically I decided to take a year off from Apple, and I wanted to for other reasons anyway. I figured that's the last year in my life I'll ever go back and get my degree that I want. Um, so aside from doing the US Festival, while, I was, while all the planning was going on last year, I was a full-time student at Berkeley. Um, I've earned my degree. I just have to petition to transfer a few units and I'll get it. And I felt that uh, 10 years ago, it was just becoming an undergraduate curriculum for, and UC Berkeley was one of the first in the country, for computer science. They taught, here's a problem, here's a bunch of the low-level techniques of combining statements and programs to find a solution. Here are a few you know, a few examples, and then you would learn. And they would, on a test, they would give you a, a problem, and you would find a good solution. Today, you're taught the, the problem and the high-level solutions. And you're taught several types of solutions, and you can make a few modifications if the problem changes a little, but you weren't, you weren't taught as heavily all the steps that led up to that particular type of solution. And uh, it gets around a lot of the new creative things. As, for example, as technology changes in computer design, this is or in software, uh, all of a sudden, you've got maybe a processor with a new instruction set, and you say, here is the solution I want. Using today's instructions, what's the best solution I can, what's the best solution I can come up with? I know the problem. What's the best solution I can come up with? Whereas now, what's going on more is, oh, there's the standard old problem. I know the standard old solution, even though it uses last year's instruction set or 10 years ago's instruction set, because it's just standard. We, you know, once you, sometimes you can know too much. One of the, benefit, well, the advantages we had at Apple, as far as our own creativity, was not having done a lot of it before, but being bright enough to come up with good creative solutions. Thank you. Steve, um, getting back to the S Festival, um, you seem pretty proud of uh, your heavy metal lineup, and I think you have excellent reason to be. The thing I don't understand, and um, has been kind of a question in the LA area, is how did Joe Walsh get mixed up in the heavy metal lineup? Um, Joe Walsh is one of the rare names that popped up almost unexpected to me with no discussion it was being considered. Of course, we had considered an Eagles reunion for, uh, boy, for months and months, and that was going to be what the US Festival this year was going to be about, and we didn't know that it didn't really exist. We were being really deceived by a manager. Um, Joe Walsh, so that was kind of a surprise. I, I think he belongs more on our third day's music format, Absolutely. but a lot of the format of the particular days was decided uh, by things that were to a large extent out of our control. For example, that day we were working for the longest time on more of a Bob Seger and Billy Joe formatted day. Not every group in the world is available or negotiable or very difficult to work with. And uh, all, Van Halen became available and they had not, we had been told no many, many times. They became available and after uh, high school and college tours, I knew that was the number one group in the world, especially in the LA, Southern California area in everyone's mind, and the US Festival, anything that was number one in the world, that's where we ought to be. So the format of the day was partly decided by other factors than we sat down in advance and planned it. It was what happened to come out, and it's sort of the creative process. Uh, so that by the time that day was booked, it had to be even the middle day, because we had booked a lot of groups into different formats 
for the first and third days. You can't go and change all that. Uh, so a lot of it was unplanned, including that overlap. And do you, do you have an MC for the heavy metal day? No MC selected for that day yet. Uh, possibly it'll come from, I think we, we, we split up three radio stations among the three days, but there are problems in picking MCs from a radio station because the other radio stations all complain. But, uh, you know, Richard's case had been already promised, um, I, so we don't have an MC for that day yet. Um, and I have one procedural question. Um, after leaving from the heavy metal day, if, if we're going to go to the third day, um, when we leave after Van Halen, do we just get in line to go in for the next day? or um, No, basically, okay, you, you leave. Every, everything ends at midnight. And uh, in the case of Van Halen, maybe they run over, but it won't be too much over. We're going to be on schedule with everything. Just like last year, the only problem we had with schedule was uh, the Kings wanted to wait an extra hour so they could play at night. Uh, you'll, you'll leave, presuming that you're, in the, you're camping out, you have a sleeping bag or something, you just walk over the hill to the camping area, and uh, it, everything moves out very smoothly, and you, just, you sleep for the night, and you aren't let, allowed in until something like 8 a.m. the next morning. The music doesn't start till noon. But what, what about the lineups? I mean, I would think I would want to get back in line as soon as possible so I could, have, so I could oh. be somewhere close yeah. to the stage. Uh, I wasn't really personally close to it or watched it last year, but I don't think they line up until, until the morning. Uh, or not too many of them. If you want to be real close to the stage, it may be a real problem this year. I don't think it was that bad last year. Oddly enough, you're going to find, talk to people who went to the US Festival, almost anywhere you were, period. It sounded perfect, and you could even, you could see it very clearly. You could see the... Steve, I'd like to thank you for last year. It was just fantastic, and the sound was good. Um, I have two questions. The first question was to clarify some rumors. One was dealing with David Bowie, that he was breaking his contract. And the other one was Van Halen. Is he actually signed up? And the, section, the second question is about, are there going to be uh, more lasers this year and more fire hoses on the towers? Okay. Question number one, Bowie rumors. Well, first of all, I hate rumors because, oddly enough, last year there were some rumors from very high-placed sources, you know, like almost Bill Graham, that McCartney and Harrison were going to be there, and I knew they accidentally spread out. I believed them myself. And you feel really disappointed when you're believing a good rumor somebody might show up and all of a sudden you feel so disappointed and let down and deceived and almost lied to that I just, I, I'm really pissed off that there's a, there's a couple rumors going around this year, so I won't even say them so that they don't go any further. Um, as far as uh, uh, Bowie uh, reneging on their contract, I don't know exactly, that doesn't sound like anything that's ever come close to happening. They got paid quite a bit is the most I could possibly say. Um, Van Halen being in or out, Van Halen is, is, is strongly in. Although, although in the very end, when you get down to it, with any of the groups that are in the show, period, if they aren't going to sit down and get over their little games of, oh, we got to bring two extra lights, you got to, there's, like, there's games they play that just take up all your promoting, promotion time, and we've got something like 33 groups this year. And if they won't get over the games and just finally sign the contract, they're all being paid many times what they've ever gotten. Uh, we might get to a situation where basically we've got to forget one group or something. But uh, Van Halen, uh, about, about two hours after that interview, came about really well mainly because I was in the, in the office with the manager and we just started using little phrases like, we got to make sure you're in the show. And boy, they sat down and point after point after point got signed instantly. Um, so uh, uh, it's, it's basically, there, is, there are possibilities of changes, but unfortunately, we've crossed that threshold now to where all the groups want to be in this year's show. And boy, none, I, don't, I don't expect any dropouts. I don't believe that any group would dare be out of it on any situation. Yeah, for instance, uh, we still have insisted in our contract that 2,000 live raccoons be released into the audience during our show. <laughs> Steve hasn't agreed to it yet, so I, I'm sure we'll be going on that point right up to the very last second. Well, we understand that Van Halen is very allergic to, uh, let's see, brown M&Ms. Apparently they've had major problems with that in the past, and we're planning uh, uh, more than they've ever seen. That's all we have time for today. Thank you all for coming, and thank you Steve Wozniak, Richard Blade, and Danny Elfman.